Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join a community cultivating civil discourse. Stay well informed while improving access to enlightening and thought-provoking programming for all. Welcome uh, to today's Commonwealth Club presentation. My name is Dr. Patrick O'Reilly. I'm the chair of the Psychology Forum at the Commonwealth Club, and I will be the moderator for today's program. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Matt Rocha. Um, Matt Rocha is a staff writer at Salon.com, where he has worked full-time since 2016. He has interviewed a number of prominent public figures in his career, including former President Jimmy Carter, former vice presidential candidate Joe Lieberman, President Trump's advisor Roger Stone, and more than a half a dozen of the 2020 Democratic presidential candidates. Uh, he's also introduced, interestingly, Tucker Carlson of Fox News. And on a lighter note, he's, inter uh, he's interviewed Elmo and Cookie Monster from Sesame Street. <laughs> um, while Rosa, Mr. Rosa, Rocha has criticized nationalism, such as his viral review of the movie 1917, he loves the ideals of freedom and human rights that form the foundation of what is good in America. And he's deeply troubled by the rise of a powerful far right that aspires to stay in power by delegitimizing its opposition's right to rule, uh, or even perhaps its right to exist. That is why he's accepted our invitation to speak today. Incidentally, if you have any questions for Mr. Rocha, please use the text chat feature. Uh, I will get your questions and as time allows, he will answer them at the conclusion of his presentation. So please, please, without further ado, welcome Mr. Rocha. It is a pleasure to be here. The Commonwealth Club has a very distinguished history and it truly is an honor to be one of its guests. When I first prepared this presentation, I did not know that President Donald Trump would call on his supporters in Washington to storm the Capitol. I did not know that many of those supporters would be open supporters of QAnon or hail from other far right groups like the Proud Boys. I did not know that at least one of the people who would die during this violent coup attempt, 35 year old Air Force veteran Ashley Babbitt would be an open supporter of QAnon I did not know that a shirtless man covered in white supremacist tattoos and wearing horns, Jake Angeli, also known as the QAnon shaman or the Q shaman, would break into the United States Senate floor, harass officials, and have an iconic photograph of him taken on the legislative floor. I suspected things like this would happen, and I feared that they would happen, but I did not know it to a certainty. When I first prepared this presentation, I did not know that Trump would call an election official in Georgia and attempt to convince him to, quote, find enough votes in that state for him to win, including through threatening him by referring to conspiracy theories that either originate from or are popular on QAnon-friendly online groups. These included him claiming that Dominion voting machines switched votes from Trump to President-elect Joe Biden, or that there is evidence that he won by a landslide. Again, I suspected that Trump was doing things like this, I feared that he would, but I did not know it to a certainty. What I did know to a certainty was that an NPR Ipsos poll in December found that although only 17% of Americans said they believed QAnon's belief in a secret elite of Satan worshiping pedophiles running the world was true, 37% said they did not know. 39% said they thought a, a supposed deep state was undermining Trump. Roughly one third of Americans said they thought voter fraud had helped Trump during the 2020 election. I also knew that Trump had retweeted a post from Ron Watkins, who is the former administrator of the online and official QAnon message board, Aitkun, and whose father, Jim, is suspected by some of being the Q behind QAnon. That tweet cast out on the 2020 presidential election results. And I knew that Trump had campaigned in Georgia to overturn the election results with the pro QAnon Congresswoman elect Marjorie Taylor Greene. We cannot predict the future to a certainty, but it is clear that there is an ecosystem of right wing disinformation that does not respect democracy. It does not respect the rights of anyone who disagrees with them. 
It does not believe that any election won by a Democrat can be legitimate. It is motivated by hate, by bitterness, by greed, and it is going to continue wreaking havoc on our society until we start to understand who they are and how to fight them. This is critical if we are going to prevent repeats of the horrible events that have transpired within the last 48 hours, the riot on the Capitol, and everything for that matter that occurred during the supposedly normal legislative session in which hundreds of members of Congress voted not to certify an election that, in, that every court that had seen it acknowledged was legitimate. What I, when I see media coverage of Jake Angeli, the white supremacist self-described QAnon shaman, there is often a tendency to laugh at him as if he is ridiculous. Yet he is not ridiculous. The Arizona man has a cult following on social media where he repeatedly claims that Trump won the 2020 election despite evidence to the contrary. He has repeatedly appeared at Trump events and repeatedly touted his association with QAnon. He circulates disinformation about Trump, presenting him as a hero and anyone who opposes him as a villain. And it is hard to imagine that if Angeli had done the same things but not been a white Trump supporter, that he would have been allowed to walk away from the riot in the Capitol with his life. When I read the Washington Post's article about Ashley Babbitt, the QAnon supporter who died while trying to storm the Capitol, the reporters seemed to make a point of mixing sympathy into their reporting. To be clear, any death is a tragedy. All human life is sacred. But there is a difference between people who die protesting for a just cause or who die through ordinary circumstances and those who die to overthrow a democratic government and replace it with a racist and fascist alternative. Her death is a tragedy because she is a human being. And it is a tragedy and a foolish waste because she gave her life for a man who, if he really cared about her and people like her, would have focused on working with the president-elect to fight the pandemic, improve the economy, and otherwise prepare America for the challenges of the 2020s. But make no mistake about it, Babbitt died defending someone who was committing treason against his country, and she fought for the cause of hate. The same can be said of Angeli. This is true for all QAnon supporters, just as it is Q, uh, just as it is true for supporters of the Confederate States of America, thousands of whom also died for the cause of white supremacy and treason. They pose an existential threat to anyone who values facts, who cares about human lives, who believes in democracy, and who opposes fascism. Now I'd like to open with this quote, which explains the first thing to understand about how people in the far-right ecosystem, such as QAnon supporters, are able to rationalize what they do. This is from a Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, a Sherlock Holmes story, a scandal in Bohemia. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. That is a joke, a visual pun, for the concept that I am going to explain in a moment, known as gish galloping. The gish gallop is a well-established method of outmaneuvering rhetorical opponents with an overwhelming onslaught of dubious arguments. Writer Carl Alviani, in quotes, made this observation. The term was named after Dwayne Gish, a biochemist and creationist who would use this tactic to try to debunk evolution. My argument is that to understand not just QAnon, but other far-right conspiracy theories and other far-right movements, you must grasp these two, concept, these two concepts. The first concept supplies the motivation. It explains how they are able to believe things that have no factual basis. It is because they start with a theory that they would prefer because it confirms their pre-existing worldview. And then they come up with facts, either twisting and exaggerating nuggets of truth or outright making things up in order to reinforce those convictions. People on the far right hold these beliefs because they want to and are inclined to. 
and they reshape their interpretation of reality or become susceptible to believing outright falsehoods because of that underlying predisposition. The second, the Gish Gallop, is important because it supplies the most common tactic that they employ. If you research QAnon and other far-right groups, you will see that they overwhelm you with spurious arguments and falsehoods. They do this because it transforms the conversation from a good faith desire to pursue truth to a bad faith exhibition in which the person they are targeting simply has to keep up with all of their arguments. The tactic succeeds because the target either collapses under exhaustion from trying to keep up with everything, or if they don't, winds up wasting time debunking falsehoods instead of sticking to the facts and having a conversation based on that. Even worse, people who are unfamiliar with the facts often see the resulting conversation as a competition between two potentially valid sets of ideas. They succumb to both sidesism, the notion that in order to seek truth, they have to find a middle ground between the two positions in a debate, even if one position is arguing in good faith and the other is not. That is why I must include one last quote in this introduction. This is from the legendary Senator and UN Ambassador Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who said, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. This speech will place QAnon in the broader context of what motivates far right wing political movements in general and offer advice on how to combat them in your own individual interactions. After all, Trump just suffered a terrible political humiliation and is creating a new set of lies for his supporters to justify the 2020 presidential elections results so that both he and they, A, won't feel like losers, and B, can justify future far right-wing political movements, including the extreme actions that we saw at the Capitol earlier this week. This is a serious subject. This is no exaggeration, an existential threat to democracy and to freedom and to human rights as we know it. Someday there will be new ideas, new targets, new movements, just like QAnon and the 2020 election conspiracy theories have precedent in older movements like McCarthyism or birtherism. And we need to recognize their underlying motives and strategies so we can effectively address them just as we need to effectively address the QAnon and 2020 conspiracy theories. Please change slides. Let's start with what QAnon believes. Last year, I interviewed Travis View for Salon. View hosts a podcast about QAnon and has covered the group for the Washington Post. His definition, what he said to me in that August 18th, 2019 article, is true and worth quoting in full. QAnon is based upon the idea that there is a worldwide cabal of Satan-worshipping pedophiles who rule the world, essentially, and they control everything. They control politicians, and they control the media. They control Hollywood, and they cover up their existence, essentially. And they would have continued ruling the world were it not for the election of President Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump, in this conspiracy theory, knows all about this evil cabal's wrongdoing. But one of the reasons that Donald Trump was elected was to put an end to them, basically. And now we would be ignorant of this behind the scenes battle of Donald Trump and the military that, that, that everyone backs him and the evil cabal were it not for Q. And what Q is, is basically a poster on 4chan, who later moved to 8chan, who reveals details about the secret behind the scenes battle and also secrets about what the cabal is doing and also the mass sort of upcoming arrest events through these posts. Because the theory has such a broad scope, there ha they have been able to gish gallop quite effectively, accusing everyone of being involved from Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden, which one might expect because they were Democratic presidential nominees, to celebrities like Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg. Q has made a number of predictions that have failed to come to pass. This has done nothing to dissuade QAnon adherents from believing in their theories. QAnon predicted 
that Hillary Clinton would be arrested in 2017. That did not happen. QAnon predicted an event called the storm, one in which the entire conspiracy would be unmasked by Trump and the wrongdoers punished. This was supposed to happen a number of times, but never did. They predicted that Republicans would sweep over Democrats in the 2018 midterm elections. That also did not happen. They predicted that Trump would win the 2020 election. That also did not happen, despite their protestations to the contrary. Their reaction to being wrong about Trump's reelection is emblematic of how they react to all of their predictions being untrue. They simply spin the narrative so that they can blame their chimerical enemies, in this case, by saying that there was massive voter fraud and that Trump really did win, but was thwarted by the supposed deep state. There have been a number of violent incidents linked to QAnon or to QAnon-esque beliefs, including a man who fired shots at a Washington pizza restaurant in 2016 to, quote, self-investigate the conspiracy theory that this restaurant was being used for child sex abuse. There was an incident where someone blocked a bridge near the Hoover Dam with an armored vehicle. That occurred in 2018. There was a California man that same year who allegedly planned on bombing a display in Illinois to make Americans aware of Pizzagate and the New World Order. There was a QAnon supporter who in 2019 was arrested due to allegedly kidnapping due to allegedly kidnapping, uh, uh, due to an alleged kidnapping scheme. There was a QAnon supporter in 2020 who was arrested for allegedly making repeated threats against Clinton and Biden. And there was a man in 2020 who live streamed himself leading Boston police on a 20 mile chase while his five young children were in the car and pleading for Trump and QAnon to help him. QAnon is harmful in other ways as well. In September, Colorado's human trafficking hotline reported that it was having trouble doing its job because of spurious phone calls from QAnon supporters. Now this raises an important point. Child sex abuse is a very real and a very serious problem. There have been identified conspiracies to perpetrate and cover up child sex abuse from the Catholic Church and Penn State University to Hollywood and the music industry. These are serious issues and need to be exposed. But QAnon adherents aren't invested in these issues because they sincerely care about children. They are invested in these issues because they offer them with a way to smear political opponents. The Anti-Defamation League notes that QAnon frequently intersects with anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about supposed Jewish control of the world with spokesperson Jake Hyman telling me at Salon in October that the movement, quote, contains a number of deeply convoluted and all-encompassing conspiracy theories, and that several aspects of QAnon lore mirror long-standing anti-Semitic tropes. The belief that a global cabal is involved in rituals of child sacrifice has its roots in the anti-Semitic trope of blood libel, the theory that Jews murder children for ritualistic purposes. He also said the obsession with George Soros and, quote, global elite bankers has, quote, deeply anti-Semitic undertones. Despite this, the movement has received validation from the highest corridors of power. In August, Trump referred to QAnon as, quote, people that love our country. Two supporters of QAnon, Green in Georgia and Lauren Boebert in Colorado, were elected to the House of Representatives in 2020. I think now we need to look at the broader historical context of QAnon. And for this, I, re I refer to an essay by the famous scholar Richard Hofstetter, who in 1964 wrote the paranoid, style, the paranoid Style in American Politics, including its historical context and its underlying more general ideas. I'm going to quote from this part extensively. He does not see social conflict as something to be mediated and compromised. Um, hold on one second. He does not see social conflict as something to be mediated and compromised in the manner of the working politician, since what is at stake is always a conflict between absolute good 
and absolute evil, what is necessary is not compromise, but the will to fight things out to a finish. Since the enemy is thought of as being totally evil and totally unappeasable, he must be totally eliminated, if not from the world, at least from the theater of operations to which the paranoid directs his attention. This demand for total triumph leads to the formulation of hopelessly unrealistic goals. And since those goals are not even remotely attainable, failure constantly heightens the paranoid sense of frustration. Even partial success leaves him with the same feeling of powerlessness with which he began. And this in turn only strengthens his awareness of the vast and terrifying quality of the enemy he opposes. The enemy is clearly delineated. He is a powerful model of malice, a kind of amoral Superman, sinister, ubiquitous, powerful, cruel, sensual, luxury loving. Unlike the rest of us, the enemy is not caught in the toils of the vast mechanism of history, himself a victim of his past, his desires, his limitations. He wills, indeed he manufactures the mechanism of history or tries to deflect the normal course of history in an evil way. He makes crises, starts runs on banks, causes depressions, manufactures disasters, and then enjoys and profits from the misery he has produced. The paranoid's interpretation of history is distinctly personal. Decisive events are not taken as part of the stream of history, but as the consequences of someone's will. Hofstetter wrote this essay at a very important point in American history. That was when Senator Barry Goldwater of Arizona had claimed the Republican presidential nomination and pushed that party farther to the right than it had ever been in recent American history. Yet Hofstetter did not limit his analysis to the Goldwater movement, which eventually culminated in the election of President Ronald Reagan, which in turn ultimately laid the foundations for the election of President Donald Trump. He also said that it could be used to describe other political movements in American history, from people who opposed, who opposed the Masons, to the Know Nothing Party that vilified Catholics, to virtually any movement that exists, to claim that some outgroup is secretly controlling the world and needs to be stopped through hatred. Yet while, troop, while Trump and QAnon are not original, at least in terms of the basic political, social, and psychological forces that they have channeled, they play off the themes of this essay. And they are doing some things that are original, that are different, and that do warrant special attention. Please change slides. One difference is that Trump is the first person to so brazenly engage in this style and also become president and to openly encourage it in his supporters. Remember that when he considered running against Barack Obama during the 2012 election cycle, he did it by playing on racist birther conspiracy theories. When he opened his 2016 presidential campaign, he didn't simply play on racism about undocumented Mexican immigrants being rapists and criminals, but created a conspiracy theory in which the Mexican government sends them over here. Another difference is that while previous movements simply had opponents, Trump's movement harnesses all of this energy and wraps it up into a cult of personality surrounding one individual, Trump himself. It operates under the assumption that Trump is an absolute hero and that anyone who opposes him by extension is an absolute villain. Interestingly, this approach even winds up applying to individuals who would normally be celebrated by conservatives, like a former FBI director, like a war hero such as Senator John McCain of Arizona. A third major point is that Trump is in many ways part of this establishment that these people claim to oppose, but, they just, but that they deliberately ignore that. For instance, more than two dozen women have come forward and accused Trump of sexual misconduct, and the president himself has been caught bragging on tape about sexually assaulting women. He has also been seen on tape palling around with Jeffrey Epstein, a known serial pedophile and sex trafficker. Trump is a longtime member of the business establishment through his real estate career and is a longtime member of the entertainment establishment 
through his reality TV show career. Yet Trump supporters ignore, rationalize, downplay, or deny these facts, or engage in whataboutism because they are inconvenient to their worship of Trump. This intersects with fascism and the 2020 election. And I'd like to include this quote that I featured in a recent article of mine for Salon titled, Trump the Fascist Artist, How the MAGA Crowd is Motivated by Aesthetics, Not Ideas, which came from the 20th century German Marxist philosopher, Walter Benjamin. He observed, quote, fascism attempts to organize the newly created proletarian masses without affecting the property structure which the masses strive to eliminate. Fascism sees its salvation in giving these masses not their right, but instead a chance to express themselves. The masses have a right to change property relations. Fascism seeks to give them an expression while preserving property. The logical result of fascism is the introduction of aesthetics into political life. It is important to keep this quote in mind when analyzing QAnon and other far-right conspiracy theories because it explains how these movements are so ubiquitous on the right and why they are fundamentally fascistic. They do not focus on addressing legitimate grievances, instead playing on bigotries among their supporters so that they can avoid recognizing the true social issues like income inequality that afflict them, that cause them their suffering. Instead, it encourages its members through acts of performance to feel like they are part of something larger than themselves, greater than themselves. I point to the recent riots at the Capitol as a great example of this. When you see the videos of these people and how they behaved, even though what they were doing was trying to affect a violent coup, many of them seem to view it almost as an act of performance art, of theater. The, the individual, Jack Angeli, who wore that ridiculous outfit before appearing on the floor in the Senate, he did this as a way of drawing attention to himself. He did this because the movement that he embraces encourages self-expression as a substitute for actual change. He wasn't fighting for a greater, deeper social cause. He was fighting to overturn the results of an election, something that would benefit only one individual, the man he hero worships with a cult-like devotion, Donald Trump. But this performance art, what he did with his body, what he did through his actions, was fascistic, was the fascist way of expressing himself and of achieving fascist political goals. When you're looking at the ideas behind QAnon, that Donald Trump is some kind of hero who's being thwarted by the deep state, that he won the 2020 presidential election, despite all of the evidence to the contrary, it is analogous to the myths that led to the rise of the Nazis in Germany in the 1930s. After World War I, many far right wingers in Germany argued that the country had lost the war because it had been betrayed by a conspiracy of Jews and leftists who personally profited from their national humiliation. The fact is that the Germans lost the war because of failures on the battlefield, plain and simple. But this single lie became so popular that it fueled the rise of the Nazis. Misinformation about the 2020 election is gradually starting to replace the QAnon traditional conspiracy theories in terms of their popularity, although that doesn't mean those old theories are going anywhere anytime soon. Trump's role in their mythos has evolved from that of a sitting president under siege to a former president needing his political humiliation to somehow be erased from the eyes of his supporters, which involves the misinformation about the 2020 presidential election. And we have to start by acknowledging that Trump laid the foundations well before the 2020 election, that there were only two possible outcomes to any election in which he was a candidate. Either the right-wing candidate won or the other side stole it. Trump encouraged this kind of thinking during the 2016 Republican presidential primaries because he lost the Iowa caucuses to Senator Ted Cruz of Texas. He claimed that he didn't actually lose the Hawkeye state. He claimed that Cruz stole it. He even said that Cruz's supposed fraud was so egregious that, quote, either a new election should take place or Cruz results nullified. Now, as we know, 
Trump ultimately overcame his defeat in Iowa and won the Republican presidential nomination. After that, he moved on to accusing Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton of doing dishonest things, quote, at many polling places. He never provided any evidence of this. He simply made things up. And because Clinton was the projected favorite in that election, this seemed to lay the foundations for him to claim that it was stolen if he should be the loser. He insisted over and over again that the election was, quote, rigged against him. He even said this during one of his debates with Clinton, and she responded by pointing out that he said the Emmys were rigged against him after being snubbed for his work on the reality TV show, The Apprentice. During that same debate, Trump refused to answer a question about whether he would accept the election's results if they went against him. He said he would prefer to keep America, quote, in suspense, and that he would, quote, look at it at the time. Only weeks before the election, Trump told supporters at a rally in Iowa that he would only accept the results, quote, if I win. Now, as in the Republican primaries, Trump did win. He defeated Clinton because of his electoral college victory of 306 to 232, although that margin would later be somewhat modified due to certain faithless electors. But he lost in the popular vote by 65.9 million to 63 million, or 48.2% to 46.1%. This obviously bothered him because once again, he claimed fraud. He said that millions of people voted illegally providing no evidence of this, and created a voter fraud commission to find evidence, which they did not, and the commission was later disbanded. Trump has been doing the same thing in the 2020 election cycle. He got himself impeached because he tried to extort the president of Ukraine into smearing Biden. I remember a Biden official telling me at the time for an article I wrote for Salon that after hearing about what Trump did to Biden, they instinctively knew that this was because Trump was, quote, afraid of the former vice president. But Biden defeated Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont in the Democratic primaries, and Trump found him running against the former vice president anyway. As in 2016, polls repeatedly showed Biden with an advantage over Trump. However, Trump had a new plan. He knew that Biden voters were more likely to submit their ballots through the mail because they were concerned about getting sick due to the pandemic. And he tried to preemptively cast doubt over the reliability of mail-in voting as a way of addressing the possibility that this would ultimately cost him the election. His claims were debunked by experts. His claims were rejected in court. But this laid the groundwork for him to later say that there were quote unquote vote dumps against him because he knew that mail-in ballots tend to be counted after in-person ballots, meaning that news outlets on election night would initially make it appear as if Trump had large leads before the Biden votes were counted and began to seemingly erode those leads or in the cases of states like Georgia and Pennsylvania, eventually eliminate them altogether. Incidentally, Trump himself was the one who engaged in cheating during this election. He infamously tried to kneecap the post office and admitted that he did this because, quote, he did, we can't have mail-in, we can't have universal mail-in voting. Trump repeatedly said, if I lose, it's rigged. He said, in August at a rally in Wisconsin, Trump told his supporters that, quote, the only way we're going to lose this election is if the election is rigged. During one of his debates with Biden, he again repeated a number of unsubstantiated claims about voter fraud. Shortly before the election, Trump told Fox News' Chris Wallace that he would not give a direct answer about whether he would accept the results of the 2020 election if they were unfavorable to him. On election day, I also must add one more thing. He told Wallace that he was, quote, not a good loser. And again, said that mail in ballot, that, quote, mail in voting is going to rig the election. 
On election day, Trump prematurely claimed that he had won. And on the day after the election, he tweeted, they are finding Biden votes all over the place, in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. So bad for our country. Two days after the election, he repeated that claim, telling reporters, quote, I've been talking about mail-in voting for a long time. It's really destroyed our system. It's a corrupt system, and it makes people corrupt, even if they aren't by nature, but they become corrupt. It's too easy. They want to find out how many votes they need, and then they seem to be able to find them. They wait and wait, and then they find them. The second tactic, of course, has been gish galloping. These have included claiming that Republican poll watchers weren't allowed to watch votes being counted in key states. He has claimed that large numbers of dead people voted, even though the numbers that have been revealed were actually quite small. He claimed that Dominion voting machines were switching votes, even though he has provided not a shred of evidence for any of this. At the time that I deliver this presentation, Trump has lost roughly 60 of the cases that he has brought to court alleging voter fraud, with many of the judges who ruled against him being fellow Republicans. And with many of those judges, being Republicans that he himself appointed. His own attorney general, William Barr, who was notoriously obsequious to Trump, admitted that after a thorough investigation, he was unable to discover any evidence of fraud that could change the 2020 election results. The Supreme Court unanimously ruled that Trump's fraud accusations should not be taken seriously, that they had no merit. When the case was brought to them in a lawsuit led by Texas, the Supreme Court was split as to whether or not the, the, Texas had the standing to present that case to them. But they, even the judges who thought that Texas did have standing, made it clear that they did not think the case itself had merit. And these included all three of the judges appointed by the president himself, including Amy Coney Barrett, uh, Brett Kavanaugh, and Neil Gorsuch. Please change slides. So the next question is, how do you defeat these people? The answer is to remember that the right to free speech does not equal the right to be taken seriously. We need to, as individuals, create a cultural and political climate in which people who express these views cannot be taken seriously and are shamed out of doing so. First, accuse them of making bad faith arguments. Here, I would like to quote my brilliant Salon colleague, Amanda Marcotte, who wrote in December, by and large, Republican voters who claim that Biden stole the election are arguing from bad faith, not delusion. This distinction is important because it shows that the intentions of Republican voters and too many of their elected leaders are sinister and need to be taken seriously as an overt assault on democracy. Understanding modern politics means understanding one crucial reality about the current landscape. Conservatives don't hold beliefs, they only have rationalizations. Many of their long-standing beliefs don't hold up to modern moral standards or rational scrutiny. Rather than give up those beliefs, however, Republicans have developed a series of disingenuous gambits, conspiracy theories, and trolling tactics to derail conversations, sow confusion, and otherwise distract those who would challenge their indefensible ideology. The second thing that we need to do is refuse to play along when they gish gallop. Stick only to the salient facts and use the term over and over again when they use the gish galloping strategy to distract from the pertinent information, from the facts that are verifiable. This term needs to be commonly used to the point where it enters the common vernacular. And I would like to coin a new phrase based on what my mother would do with me when I was an immature child and would try to win arguments by just talking and talking and talking. I'm going to call this stern stopping. I'm not going to call it roja ing because that doesn't quite roll off the tongue. If some, and what my mother would do, and what I think everyone should do when dealing with people in these movements, because they also behave like immature children, is to force them to calm down and say that if they have a good argument, they should start by bringing up only one point at a time. And if the first two points are easily debunked and are so far-fetched that they're either non-falsifiable or 
simply cannot be proved through any rational metric, then that's it. They don't get to continue. No one has the right to overwhelm you with bad arguments as a way of intimidating or exhausting you into silence. They should get to make one or two points, and if those points are clearly being made based on bad information and in bad faith, they do not get to be taken seriously. They lose credibility. My last recommendation is that we deplatform them. Everyone has First Amendment rights, but people only have a right to be taken seriously when they base their arguments on facts and make those arguments in good faith. People who say things that are unsupportable and who make, argument, make arguments not to advance truth, but to disingenuously push an agenda should never be given the veneer of respectability. And so that is how I close my speech. Like I said at the beginning, I never expected that when I was delivering this presentation that I would do so in the same week that for the first time in American history, a president egged on his supporters to intimidate Congress into not recognizing the results of a legitimate <coughs> election. We have had, at this point, 44 individuals serve as president of the United States. Of those 44 individuals, 11 were sitting presidents who sought another term and were spurned by the voters. Of those 11 presidents, 10 of them accepted the voters' verdict, accepted that democracy mattered more than their own egos and ambitions, and stepped down. Trump is the first who has made it a serious possibility that he won't. And it is movements like QAnon and like other far right wing movements that made this possible. And on that note, I would like to again thank the Commonwealth Club and bring my presentation to a close. I want to thank you very much, Mr. Rocha. That was uh, <laughs> quite illuminating. Um, and incidentally, for the people who have watched this presentation, if you would like to contact Mr. Rocha, uh, he can be reached at his website. I'm going to spell it out. M-A-T-T-T-M-A-T-T-H-E-W-R-O-Z-S-A dot com. And I'm going to check uh, Mr. Rocha uh, to see if we have any. Interestingly, I expected a, an onslaught of questions, but perhaps you've just answered <laughs> ahead of time anybody's questions that might have been there. So um, I do want to thank you. It was a great presentation, uh, quite valuable information, and, and it was remarkable that your presentation was actually scheduled months ago for today given what happened yesterday. So thank you very, very much, Mr. Rocha. And again, for those of you who are interested in contacting Mr. Rocha, he said he certainly will welcome your comments. Uh, www.mattheworozsa.com. So thank you again, Mr. Rocha. That was absolutely delightful. Thank you for um, having me. Good night to everybody. Good night and good luck. And we. Yep, we've run out of time, so I want to thank you again for joining us this evening, and I hope you have a very lovely evening. Good night.